Mi nombre es Pedro Reynolds Cuellar, yo soy estudiante de doctorado de MIT y el, presi el presidente de la Asociación de Colombianos también en, en MIT. Eh, bueno, el panel que tenemos a continuación es titulado Climate Change, Comprehensive Solutions for a Global Challenge. Eh, y antes de iniciar, quiero leerles unas palabras muy cortas y hacer la presentación de nuestro invitado. Recognizing that climate change represents an urgent and potentially irreversible threat to human societies and the planet, and thus requires the widest possible cooperation of all countries and their participation in an effective and appropriate international response with a view to accelerating the reduction of global greenhouse gas emissions, also recognizing that deep reductions in global emissions will be required in order to achieve the ultimate objective and emphasizing the need for urgency in addressing climate change. Acknowledging that climate change respect, promote and consider their respective obligations to, on human rights, the right to health, the rights of indigenous peoples, local communities, migrants, children, persons with disabilities, and people in vulnerable situations, and the right to development, as well as gender equality, empowerment of women, and inter intergenerational equality. These excerpts from the Paris Agreement document encapsulate the importance of one of the greatest challenges we face as a society. To talk about how we can go about facing climate change, we invited Mr. Chad Frischman. Chad is a vice president and research director at Project Drawdown. And it's a really interesting organization that I'm sure he will introduce during his talk, where uh, Chad at Drawdown leads the Drawdown Coalition. He's a senior, uh, the senior research team and the fellowships pro uh, program. He is the lead researcher and principal architect of the drawdown, of, uh, drawdown uh, me methods and models that are used in all draw drawdown-related publications. Prior to drawdown, Chad was the senior program officer of the European, taught at the University of Oxford and the University of California at Berkeley, and worked as a consultant and researcher for numerous organizations for small grassroots to nonprofits to UN agencies such as UNESCO and the International Fund of Agricultural Development. Al final de la charla de Chad, vamos a tener unas preguntas. De nuevo les pedimos el favor que estén hechas como preguntas y que sean cortas. Eh, les queremos agradecer a todos los uh, supporters de la conferencia por su apoyo. And without further ado, I give you Chad Freshman. Thank you, Pedro, and thank you to the organizers of this conference. Um, thank you to my uh, fellow panelists who gave the floor to me today. Um, and thank you all for coming here. It's my pleasure to be here to introduce you to Project Drawdown. So what is Drawdown? Drawdown is a reframing of how we think about global warming and climate change. It's a new goal for humanity, a goal about a vision of the future that we want, where global warming can be reversed, a reversal of global warming. But how do we get there? It's in the name Drawdown itself, the definition of Drawdown. It's that point in time when atmospheric concentrations of greenhouse gases begins to decline on an annual basis. It's that point when we start to take out more than we put in to the atmosphere. And the proposition here is really rather simple. If we can achieve drawdown, we can affect global cooling, a reversal of anthropogenic global warming. It sounds so simple because it's an answer to a problem statement, right? The problem is global warming. The effect is climate change, 
Right? Climate change is the feedback of the system telling us what's wrong. But drawdown is the only way we know, with relative confidence, to start the process of reversing global warming. It's the answer to the problem statement. But it sounds daunting, perhaps, right? But what if I were to tell you that we ha already have the solutions to reverse global warming? Uh, okay. Ah, there we go. Fantastic. Okay, sorry about that. So, Project Drawdown has... Oops, Project Drawdown has mapped, measured, and modeled 80 existing solutions, technologies, and practices that we know today that, com when combined, can reverse global warming, start the process of drawdown. We've also described 20 coming attractions. These are solutions that are in the pipeline, right? And when they become viable, they will accelerate the process. But how do these solutions work? Well, they have do one of three things, three mechanisms to achieve drawdown. One is replacing existing fossil fuel-based energy generation with renewable alternatives. Two, to reduce consumption through technological efficiency and behavior change. And three, to biosequester carbon in our plants, biomass, and soils through a process we all know called photosynthesis. Humanity knows what to do. We have the technology, practices, and knowledge to achieve drawdown. What we lack is the will to do it. Now, why is that the case? Well, first of all, the science for the past 25 years has focused on the problem and the effect, global warming and climate change. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, has done a brilliant job Right? One of the greatest scientific endeavors in human history. They have described and explained the global warming and climate change. Right? And many organizations have worked to uh, and continue to work on this question. It's foundational, incredibly important. But it is also daunting and complex. It's inaccessible and distant for most people to act upon. Right? And climate... so. Uh, most people to act upon. And what else is the uh, additional factor is how we see and experience and learn about global warming in the media today. We are inundated, inundated with stories of doom and gloom. Sorry, this is getting a little bit wacky here. So, sorry about that. So, stories of doom and gloom, headlines that are terrifying and pictures that are horrifying, right? This is London. But do not worry. London is not flooding. This was a photoshopped image constructed to elicit fear and panic. And when we're confronted with fear and panic, what do we do? We distract ourselves. We turn away. This is getting a little bit... Uh, yeah. So... Um, who, who wouldn't want to know how a frog ornament was used as a murder weapon, right? So we distract ourselves. Right. Okay. Some, a, lot of these, uh, a lot of these articles actually come from very good science, right? And good articles, good reporting. This originally comes from the New York Times, but it's been rebranded, reframed to elicit panic and disempowerment. The apocalypse is upon you and there's nothing you can do about it. So you might as well order some discounted wine, right? And it's this combination of fear and uh, confusion and distance with the science, fear, disempowerment, and panic that leads to apathy, an acceptance of the status quo. And as we know, fear and apathy and confusion are the tools of oppression, right? And Project Drawdown was created to counter, to reframe that prevailing discourse, to change this, and reframe it to one of understanding, possibility, and opportunity. Right? If climate change is happening to us, we're victims. But if it's happening for us, it's an opportunity, a turning point for humanity 
to make change, right? But of course, positive thinking and messaging alone aren't going to get us there, right? So Project Rodham is not only a uh, communications organization, but it's also a living, ongoing research program that is a collaborative effort that brings together researchers from around the world, business leaders, advocates, thought leaders, policymakers, all over the world together in a collaborative effort that's data-driven, scientifically rigorous, right, and based on the best available information. It's a coalition, a collaborative effort, right, because we can't do this in silos any longer. We have to work together across sectors, from energy, transportation, buildings, land use, uh, agricultural sector, and of course, uh, human rights-based approaches. Here is just a uh, selection of 65 of the research fellows that came and worked with us for over three years to assemble this data to do the technical assessment of these solutions. Right? And we think of these folks as the next generation of climate leaders. 50% have PhDs, all have one or more a master's degree. But we're not a bunch of climate scientists and data wonks. Now, don't get me wrong, we love data. But we have brought together a diversity of perspective. We all, surely we have climate scientists, we have engineers, we have scientists, and uh, architects, engineer, engineering, law, for people from backgrounds in law, business, international development, forestry, agriculture. It's the diversity of perspective that we bring to this project that we have to start thinking. We can't just be uh, climate modelers and uh, data modelers and climate scientists behind computers. We need to actually have that experience of these different sectors to the table. But what do we all do? Well, draw down maps and models solutions to reverse global warming, okay? We looked around and we could not find a global systems model that was a bottom-up, solutions-oriented agency perspective, right? There are lots of models out there, but few aggregated the results together and few were as comprehensive, uh, including not only energy, but land use, right? And so we built our model from the ground up. And we built three core model frameworks. One focuses on reduction and replacement solutions. These are energy and energy efficiency solutions that are based on market-driven functional demand. We built a land use model that evaluates solutions based on diverse agroecological zones, based on the biophysical characteristics of land types, and a food systems model that looks at the consumption and supply of different uh, commodities at a per capita basis. Now, through these three models constructs, we can evaluate nearly any technology or practice at global or regional scales. But this is not a model that is inaccessible to people. It's open source. It's accessible to everyone. And we built it with that intention in mind so that it doesn't require a PhD and 10 years of experience to open the file. We wanted to create a model that was meaningful for decision makers at all scales. And through these different modules, we can do that. And I should say that our next project is uh, building an oceans-based model for marine technologies and practices. But when we put these solutions to the test, we put them through our models, we collect this data from all over the world, we ha can't just rely on solution-specific models, because solutions don't operate in isolation. Right? They're an integrated system, and we have to think about solutions as a whole within that system, what their impact could be. So we in, not only do we have these solution-specific models across those three core structures, we've also built integration models to deal with double counting, uh, system dynamics and interaction effects, uh, and to ensure market and land alignment. And this is just a, a schematic of our building system, right? which looks at this, the flow from uh, source to output, and the different energy uses of uh, components of a building. We have to think about the entire system. Um, and here is our waste uh, schematic. I'm going to go over this really quickly just to give a brief 
overview of what, how we have to map out these different solutions. And as we can see, the impact of population, agricultural production, our diets, how much we waste, all has to be fed through the stock feedstocks into different solutions that provides organic municipal solid waste fraction. Right? But that's a feedstock into composting, into waste to energy. When we calculate heating values and waste energy, we have to understand how much available organic material can be there. Right? And then, of course, composting is part of that solution. We can't overcount or double count any of this. So we have to think about this as a system. And here is our uh, land use uh, system. And again, different types of uh, 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 land types and, uh, and different biophysical characteristics make different solutions are feasible within that particular land area. But as we see, it's not just about the system itself. It's a system of systems because these, all these sectors are interacting. Right? So it's a brief overview of our methodology, but when we do this, when we subject these solutions and all of this data into our models that these 65 researchers uh, have put together. And of course, I should mention, we have 130 global advisors from around the world who have helped guide and advise and review our, our research. All of this filters into our results, right? And the results that we report, the models produce many results, but the ones that we focus on to report and publish are the net uh, first cost, then it's operational savings, and the total emissions avoided or carbon sequestered. Remember, emissions avoided and carbon is sequestered. That's how we achieve drawdown, a combination of avoiding putting up into the atmosphere and pulling down carbon from the atmosphere. And so the results that we've come up are quite interesting. Here's a list of our top 20. Now, it's important to remember that this ranking is based on emissions and sequestration potential. And it's based on total gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalent. So we evaluate carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and fluorinated gases, and you convert them to the CO2 equivalent based on global warming potential. And then we cumulatively add them up over the potential adoption over, tw over 30 years from 2020 to 2050. But you can actually reorder this ranking in any number of ways, based on cost effectiveness, dollars per ton, uh, overall uh, ROI, uh, net present value. But we chose to uh, focus on the emissions reduction sequestration potential because that's what gets us to drawdown. Now, what are some of the interesting results that we've found? So first of all, when we think about uh, solutions to global warming and climate change, what's the first thing we think of? We think of electricity generation, right? Um, and uh, what we found really surprisingly is that of the top 20 solutions, only five related to electricity generation, right? And the reason is because when we uh, do our evaluation of the food system, we start to see that eight of the top 20 relate directly to how we consume, how we waste, and how we produce our food. Shocking. And perhaps, sorry, perhaps um, even more challenging in our perspective is the number one solution, refrigerant management. Now, we weren't expecting refrigerant. We're kind of, I have to say, hoping for something a little bit more exciting, a little sexier than refrigerant management. Um, but it is a very, very interesting solution. And why? It's because of hydrofluorocarbons, HFCs, right? We did a great job with the Montreal Protocol in banning the production of uh, chlorofluorocarbons, right? Because of their effect on the ozone layer. But we replaced those refrigerants with hydrofluorocarbons, which are hundreds to thousands of times more potent a greenhouse effect than carbon dioxide. And so what the solution actually says is if we control the leakage of uh, hydrofluorocarbons from our air conditioners and from our refrigerators and all these appliances that provide cooling, if we can control the leakage and destroy those uh, hydrofluorocarbons at end of life, right, we can avoid up to 90 gigatons of CO2 equivalent. What do we do typically? We typically throw these uh, appliances into the, the landfill and they leak over time. But if we destroy them, 
90 gigatons could be avoided. Now, this does not include the Kigali Agreement. Right? For those of you who are familiar with the Kigali, this was a, a, a landmark uh, international, pol international agreement that called for the phase-out of hydrofluorocarbons over the next year, decades, depending on if you were a high, lo low, or medium-income country. Right? If we include the phase-out of the productions of HFCs plus the destruction of existing refrigerant banks, this solution could reduce or avoid up to 160 gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalent. And if we were to speed up and accelerate right, that phase out by 2020 across the world, we, there are some studies that estimate up to 200 gigatons could be avoided. So it's truly the number one solution. Um, and I have to say, you know, we were surprised but we've gotten a tremendous amount of response from a lot of refrigeration associations from around the world who've been eagerly uh, saying, we've been saying this for years, right? But this is rather a surprise, challenges our way of thinking. We typically think of energy as the number one, but actually refrigeration and our food system as a whole have more of an impact on solutions. So all of this research that's done all of these solutions that we've done uh, our modeling and eval evaluation on, and, and of course the rankings and the, 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 the results from all of our models are all presented in our book, Drawdown. Right? I've just shown the top 20, but there are 80 existing solutions, and there are 20 coming attractions presented in this book. This book was released one year ago this month, April 2017. Now within a week of publication, it reached the New York Times bestseller list. And it's been on that list several times over the past year. The British, the UK edition was released in December. The French translation was released uh, this past Saturday in Paris, actually. And next month, the Portuguese edition is being released in uh, Brazil. It is also being translated in Chinese, Arabic, German, Spanish, Vietnamese, 10 languages within one year it's going to be translated. Now I say this not to pat ourselves on the back, Right? There are too many, remember, this is a collaborative. There's too many people to pat your pat on the back. Right? I'm saying this because this is not the normal book that you read on climate change or global warming. Right? It is not the IPCC AR5 Working Group 3 report. Right? It's completely different. Right? Both are essential contributions. But what this book is, I like to think of this as a book that you could take to the park on a Sunday and enjoy your day. You could take this part, or you could read this book before you go to sleep and not have a nightmare. Now, how many book, uh, books on climate change or global warming can you say that? Now, honestly, think about that. You, it's hard to find, right? And that's why this book has been so successful, because it's not a uh, uh, confusing, complicated, distancing technical manual. It's based on rigorous science, but this is just an example of one of the spreads of one of the solutions, rooftop solar, a two-page narrative, a story about solutions. It is based in the found, on the research that we've conducted, and there are, is technical information here, of course, but we've gotten rid of all the jargon. There's no discussion of mitigation, adaptation, uh, stabilization, two-degree targets, Paris agreements. We've gotten rid of the jargon. You don't see CO2 and CH4 and N2O. You see uh, carbon dioxide, methane spelled out to make it as accessible to the broadest audience as possible. We've done away with the war analogy, right? You're not going to read about tackling, battling, cutting, slashing, fighting climate change, fighting nature. First of all, it's futile. Second of all, we need to present these not as a battle, right? We need to present these as opportunities, possibilities for us to transform the system. And so this book has been so successful because it's engaging, it's empowering, and it's a different way of thinking about solutions. And we also have to think, reframe how we see images of solutions, right? When we think of rooftop solar, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Maybe a warehouse in an urban environment with a, a roof covered in solar panels. Maybe a very nice house in a rich, rich residential neighborhood 
with solar panels on the roof, right? But we need to stop thinking of these solutions as solutions for ur rich urban countries, right? These have applications in high-income and low-income countries, urban settings and rural settings. This is a household on a straw island in Lake Titicaca, right? Receiving their first solar panel. Before get receiving this, they were using kerosene for their cooking and lighting needs. Kerosene on a straw island, right? So this solution is not only provides abundant uh, energy for their household needs, but safety and security for their families. So we have to really rethink how we see these images or see these solutions. And we have to think outside of just electricity generation, right? We think of coal-fired plants, we think of natural gas, but we have to think also about our mobility options, right? How we move about in the world, right? And we all make these decisions every day. Whether we choose to drive, whether we choose to walk, whether we choose to ride a bike, or use mass transit, or the many other mobility options around us, we have to think about avoiding liquid uh, fossil fuel combustion in our internal combustion engine vehicles, right? Cars. We can replace this with other solutions that are healthier for us and better for the environment and reduce uh, emissions. Um, and so, and what we also have to remember, of course, is that when we adopt these solutions, we make these choices, right? It, when we think about the uh, integrated system in parallel, Electric bikes, electric vehicles, mass transit become even more of a solution, have a higher impact when we also adopt renewable energy as part of the grid. So in parallel, these solutions become even more impactful as we think of it as a system. But we also have to think outside of just energy, right? Again, we have been focusing on energy for 25 years. Right? We have to break the silos and start thinking about how we manage our ecosystems. Our forests, wetlands, peatlands, these are carbon sinks. Now remember, right? uh, plants, carbon is stored in plants' biomass and soils. So our existing ecosystems are, uh, are, uh, are store a tremendous amount of carbon. We estimate that if we were to protect our existing forests, up to 896 gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalent would be safeguarded, right? Now, what happens is we degrade these ecosystems and the process every time we degrade or convert land, that land to some other purpose, we produce emissions. So by protecting our forests, we not only uh, uh, avoid that degradation and emissions that come from that, we also safeguard carbon. But we also have to think about, you know, how we uh, manage our currently degraded land. Tropical forests, this is a solution, our number five solution on our list of 80 existing solutions. Tropical forest restoration is about protecting currently degraded land and allowing it to naturally regrow into its, uh, it, to its uh, original ecosystem, right? 61 gigatons of sequestration is potential, potential over 30 years. That's all drawing down from the atmosphere, right? And I have to say, Colombia has done a very good job with, uh, with committing, I believe it's up to a million hectares to uh, protect and to naturally regrow for a tropical forest restoration by 2020. So they've made a strong commitment to this as a solution. But it's not only about our eco managing our ecosystems, we have to think about how we produce our food, right? Currently, annual, modern annual cropping me methods are a net emitter of carbon. We have to continually use more and more synthetic fertilizers to produce the same amount of yield or less over time. But through regenerative practices like no-till, cover cropping, crop rotation, um, uh, compost and manure applications, organic practices, combination of these practices, we can convert uh, cropland to be a net sequester of carbon. Now the brilliant thing about this is by increasing soil organic carbon through regenerative agricultural practices, we increase uh, or improve soil health and fertility, water retention, Right? Increase yields, which improves the livelihoods of smallholders and 
provides financial benefits to large-scale farming operations. But regenerative agriculture is by no means a new technology or, or way of thinking. We have been practicing regenerative agriculture for millennia, right? So very much trying to get back to the way we produce food in the past. And we have to think about our livestock management. So think about managed grazing, and in this particular solution, silvopasture. Right? Silvopasture simply means pasture in forests. Right? Silvo, forest, pasture. It's about uh, planting trees in, on pasture land. Right? And the potential here is uh, tremendous. It has one of the highest sequestration rates of all agri regenerative agricultural practices. Right? It's the number nine solution. 31 gigatons can be uh, reduced and sequestered because of silvopasture. Amazing. And again, I have to have kudos to, uh, to Colombia because they have actually produced uh, uh, national policies and financial mechanisms to support the adoption of silvopasture and is actually a model, a model for silvopasture adoption in the world, throughout the world, um, both silvopasture and intensive silvopasture. So Colombia is really ahead in this as a solution here. But it's not just how we waste our, or sorry, how we produce our food, it's also how we consume and waste it. Reduced food waste, right? About 8% eight, about, uh, eight of our emissions are caused by, by food waste. If we took all the global food waste as a whole and compared it on a country by country basis, it would be the number three emitter after the United States and China. Reduced food waste, or food waste, right? Now, the problem here is that we have to think about where along the supply chain uh, wastage happens. And it's different in high-income versus low-income countries. In low-income countries, it's a technology problem. It's about storage and distribution, right? And so if we solve this problem by providing natural refrigerants, again, by coupling solutions, refrigerant management, and reduce food waste by a food loss by providing technology for storage and distribution in low-income countries, we can have a significant difference, right? But if we think about high-income countries, it's not a technology problem. We waste 20 to 30 percent of our food at the point of market and consumption. What does that mean? That means we choose to waste our food. We purchase more than we consume and we waste that food, right? So it's about behavior change and making sure that we purchase what we consume and consume what we purchase, right? And the impact is astounding. The number three solution, 70 gigatons reduced. And the number four solution, a plant-rich diet. Now this is not vegetarian, this is not vegan, Though if that's your life choice, that's absolutely acceptable and very good. We applaud that. But this isn't about making those decisions for you. A plant-rich diet calls for the overall reduction or reduced consumption of animal-based proteins to around 50 to 55 grams per capita per day from an average of 90 to 100 grams in high-income countries. But it's not just about animal proteins, meat, it's also about overconsumption generally. And again, this is a difference between low-income and high-income countries, right? We establish a healthy diet, rather conservatively, I should say, at 2,500 kilocalories per capita per day. It's actually fairly high, but it's considered to be a healthy diet. That means taking uh, more uh, plant-based uh, part of your diet and reducing your meat consumption but in low-income countries, uh, on average, they consume less than 2,500 kilocal kilo kilocalories per capita. So we need to increase the consumption and nutritional intake in low-income countries. In high-income countries, it's the exact opposite. We overconsume much higher than 2,500 kilocalories. So we have to balance this out, reduce in high in our consumption in high-income countries, and increase in low-income countries to create a healthy diet, right? Now, why is this so important? Why is the food, uh, plant-rich diet number four, and then number three, reduce food waste? Because every single seed that is produced, every oil, every piece of meat that you consume, every plant 
is embodied with emissions. Carbon dioxide, methane, fluorinated gases, nitrous oxide, right? Every piece of food that you consume, every kilocalorie has emissions that are associated with it. So every time we waste or overconsume something, right, those are emissions throughout the supply chain that we are essentially putting into the atmosphere. And the brilliant thing about this, as you think of it as a system, as a whole, right, if we were to adopt regenerative agricultural practices for production, right, on a global scale, and we were to adopt a plant-rich diet and or produce our food waste as a system, right, in, in, in parallel, we would be able to produce enough food today, according to our calculations, for the entire world's population to have a healthy diet now until 2050, including population growth. We're fed this myth that food production needs to double, and it does because of population growth if we assume a business as usual. But if we don't, if we think beyond that, a new goal, remember a future that we want as a system, we can produce enough food on cropland today without having to uh, 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 convert land to cropland, convert forests or grasslands to cropland. Right? Astounding to think about that, right? We don't have to do that. So these numbers actually are a combination of avoided deforestation and reduced agricultural production. We don't count methane, in the, uh, methane production and in the waste stream. We don't count the carbon associated with transportation. We don't count the storage of refrigerant uh, gases from fluorinated gases, refrigerants, for storage and distribution. We don't count that because we count it elsewhere in the system with other solutions, so we don't want to double count. So this is just about production and avoid the deforestation. Astounding. Perhaps even more challenging in our way of thinking is educating girls, right? The number six solution. Why is this a solution? Well, because we find, and studies show, that girls who have 12 to 13 years of education, essentially with equal access and quality education, uh, uh, compared to boys, right? So we're talking about universal education. But girls who have 12 to 13 years make, have dramatically different life outcomes, right? Instead of being pulled out of school in many countries to uh, marry early, marry young, and raise children from a young age, if they stay in school, they tend to have improved economic conditions, delayed onset of marriage, right? And smaller family size by providing the right to have equal educational opportunities for girls across the world, which we are now deficient on. We need to support this. We can have a significant impact on fertility rates. And what that means is an increased uptake of family planning. Now, what's family planning? Family planning is the, uh, the right to choose when, how, and if you have a family. It's about reproductive health care. It's about education and the acceptance of the use of contraceptions and to choose the freedom of choice of when you have and how you have a child, right? And what we find is that when people, when uh, populations have access to equal education and access to family planning resources, right, we can see a shift in our population trajectories. The, the, the emissions that are associated here are with the difference between the high UN population trajectory and the medium, right? We typically think the medium is a given, but every year we miss our target. And that's because we need a massive uptake of family planning and educating of, of girls, equal access to education. And um, of course, mortality uh, rates and, uh, and uh, migration have a factor, but the principal means of that shift from the high population to a, a medium is family planning, right? Family planning. And that means fewer people, about 1.1 billion fewer people on our planet. That's fewer few, needs consumption of food. That's less uh, electricity demand, less fewer buildings, right? Fewer waste that's produced, right? 1.1 billion people. That means markets shift dramatically. And all of that is embodied emissions. And you'll see the difference, I hope this will work, 
The difference here between educating girls, number six and number seven, is the exact same number. And that's because the actual effect is uh, population change, population, different po population trajectories. But we couldn't quite figure out how to demarcate the difference between universal education and uh, reproductive health care and, and, and access to contraceptions and so on. It's, it's not clear the difference, so we split it down the middle. If you combine family planning and educating girls, it's 120 gigatons avoided. The number one solution is about women's empowerment. So those are our existing solutions. I showed you the top 20. I showed you some quick examples of the solutions that we've highlighted in our book. And it's important to remember that we've done the math on existing solutions, technologies and practices that we know are working, that are viable today and are scaling. We also profile 20 coming attractions. These are technologies and practices, again, that are on the pipeline. They, when they come online, they will accelerate our, the adoption, they will accelerate the potential to achieve drawdown. Right? These are things like autonomous vehicles, uh, uh, artificial leaves, intensive civil pasture, which again, Colombia is a model for the development of intensive civil pasture, perennial crops, um, uh, smart grids, etc. These are on the horizon, and when they become viable, they will have significant impact. But the question is, is drawdown possible by 2050, given the existing technologies today? And the answer is yes. Yes. The top 20 aren't going to get us there. The top 30, 40, 50, 60, not going to get us there. We need to be adopting all 80 solutions that we profile in our book in parallel from now till 2050 to just start the process of drawing down. So cumulatively, the impact, drawdown is possible. Now, the brilliant thing about this, right? Remember, the, the drawdown is the answer to a problem statement, right? But the brilliant thing about this is we want these solutions whether or not Global warming was a problem. Think about why these solutions are scaling today. Renewable energy is about clean, abundant energy. Right? It's about uh, air pollution. It's about our health and well-being and avoiding emissions. When we think about uh, family planning and educating girls, this is about human rights, gender parity, economic development, and helps to reverse global warming. When we think about uh, regenerative agricultural practices, right? I showed regenerative ag, but there's also conservation ag, improved rice uh, cultivation, tree intercropping, multi-strata agroforestry, right? Many more solutions that we profile are regenerative in nature. I couldn't go through all of them, but why are they being adopted? Because they improve soil health and fertility, improve water retention, are, uh, increase yield, and are beneficial to smallholder farmers and large-scale operations. They also convert our agricultural system from a net emitter to a net sequesterer. When we think about ecosystem management, forest protection, our wetlands, our peatlands, right? This is the intrinsic value of these ecosystems. It's about biodiversity preservation, right? It's about the oxygen that we breathe. It also helps safeguard carbon. And when we think about uh, reduced food waste and plant-rich diet, it means providing a healthy diet for the world's population without having to uh, 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 cut down forests and convert grasslands. It's about a healthy population throughout the world. Right? And so when you look at these system of solutions uh, being, working together as a system, right, what we see this is actually a shift. A shift from a business as usual that is inherently exploitative and extractive to a new normal that is, by nature, restorative and regenerative. Right? This is the future that we want. This is the future that we want. And reversing global warming is a very welcome co-benefit. Thank you. Okay.
Eh, vamos entonces a pasar a la sección de preguntas. Eh, tenemos un par de personas que nos están ayudando con las preguntas, así que levanten la mano. Por aquí tenemos una pregunta. Thank you. Hi, my name is Antonio Copete. I'm a postdoc here at the astronomy department. Um, I, one, one key feature of, um, of the Colombian urban centers is that they're located at a, at a range of altitudes, right? So we have from Barranquilla at sea level to Bogota, which is at about 9,000 feet or 2,600 meters. And I've always wondered wh what's, the, um, what's the relationship between altitude and, and climate change or, or, or in general environmental effects. Uh, like, for example, you know, in a city like Bogota, you know, uh, things like air conditioning, refrigeration that you mentioned so much, uh, and, and related things might be, you know, much, much cheaper than a, a city at a lower altitude. So thinking about the future, where we should be growing, where we should be uh, uh, focusing uh, our development, uh, thinking of this variable of altitude, since, since we have so many mountains, where, where do you think we should go? Like, how do you think we should grow? Um, that's, a, that's a good question. I I'm, um, I'm, I'm, would not say that I'm a, an expert on Colombia, right? So what we're, I agree with you, there's definitely a lot of variability in the solutions of their adoption trajectories and their impacts, right? So when we do a global systems model, it only has a certain amount of facility, right? And local decision making, because it's a system as a whole. And so what we can do is collect a lot of data and give a sort of a, mm, a potential boundary of possibility for any one of these solutions. But ultimately, these are tools that need to be developed at the local scale because of the great variability that you suggest. So not all these solutions are going to be relevant in the same way everywhere. And we can't, from California, tell the world how to adopt solutions, right? So we've built a tool to give us, to start that process. Our phase one of research has focused on that question of what if, what if it's possible to achieve this at a global scale, what could the impacts be? Our phase two of research, which we're embarking upon the, uh, this, starting this fall actually, um, is looking at the question how to. What are the uh, contextual boundaries we must consider, like a municipality, like different uh, countries and, and different localities, what are the suite of solutions that are applicable at that scale? What are the policy and financial mechanisms that are gonna get us on that trajectory? what needs to happen, and what are the differences between different localities because of that variability. And we're embarking upon that research through a collaborative effort, right? Because again, we can't be in California telling the world what to do. So we're initiating uh, regional and local hubs around the world to democratize our model and democratize our approach so that we can start to build uh, a better understanding of what these solutions look like and what many other solutions that may not be profiled amongst the 80 global, there are many other solutions that might be applicable at different localities, right, in different altitudes and so on. So we're embarking upon that uh, as a next phase uh, of research. We have 23 research institutions from around the world that want to help us develop this, this uh, assessment of local scales. Um, I was just in uh, Europe uh, last, uh, last week to announce the launch of Drawdown Europe, uh, one of those regional hubs that's taking shape. Uh, there's Drawdown Canada, Drawdown Australia, Drawdown New Zealand. And so these is, this is how we hope to answer that question. I don't have a good answer for you now, because uh, we can't dictate, again, what the precise solutions are at that scale. We invite and hope that, you know, maybe a Drawdown initiative in Colombia can take shape where we can start to understand what are those solutions at that scale. Thank you. Hay una pregunta por aquí. Si no. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation, Shad. Um, I was really interested when you mentioned about uh, plant-rich diets and how they can contribute to diminish uh, the effect in climate change. I was wondering particularly how to promote that in countries that have embedded in the culture uh, the consumption of meat and uh, different kind of uh, elements that can contribute to this uh, global warming and production of greenhouse gases and uh, which which are some 
alternatives to to promote this kind of uh, lifestyles and diets. Mm -hmm. And again, I think this is this is speaking to that same question about local variability, right? And we can't, and every location is going to be somewhat, something different, right? So we can't prescribe how people need to act and what are the, what are the best ways to, change, to have behavior change at different scales, right? So, but surely educational platforms, communication needs to be uh, promoted to show what is a healthy diet, right? Because uh, in fact, most, most of the world still currently uh, consumes a plant-rich diet, right? Still majority of the world, are, you know, in terms of population. But when we think into the future and economic development in many countries, right, we, we assume is that they're going to emulate medium and high-income countries and their consumption patterns. That means they're going to, we assume, uh, consume more meat. So part of it is saying, you know, uh, having educational communication platforms that reduce that potential, Right? and educate people that the way they're consuming and living their life today is uh, healthy. And perhaps more importantly, to increase their consumption right, of uh, more plant-based proteins and plant-rich diet. But that's a, it's also quite a challenge because every culture is slightly different, and it requires that local perspective and capacity to understand that, uh, the dynamics of pol local policy, economics, and society to be able to really uh, come up with strategies to communicate that message most effectively. Um, so, so again, uh, uh, I think uh, part of what we're doing with our second phase of research is looking at what are those enablers and accelerators, right? Again, policies, financial mechanisms, and educational platforms that are most relevant at that locality, but by democratizing the approach and allowing, uh, you know, local experts to under to help contribute to that because we can't do that from, from, from uh, California. And that's been one of the fallacies, I think, of a lot of global systems modeling and uh, global approaches to, these, uh, to, to, uh, to uh, climate change, has been we have the answer for everybody. But reality is we need to show and highlight these solutions, and these are relevant across the world, but how they are applied needs to be based on local expertise, right? Thank you, Chad. Um, Thank you for your presentation. And Santiago Matamoros, a student at the business school here. <clears throat> Very refreshing to see a uh, climate change presentation that is solution-based and not issues-based. Um, but I, it, it was more worrisome for me at the end that you said that we have to do 80 things in parallel. I believe that that's unrealistic. So where would you start among the 80 solutions if you were a developing country like Colombia? Um, they've already started. The reason why that they're, we call them existing solutions is because they're already being implemented. They're being implemented around the world. Now, one of these solutions doesn't have a current adoption, and they're already scaling. Some of them are scaling quite fast. Others are a little bit slower, right? So there, it's a precondition to be on our list that we have enough data right, on current adoption and future trajectories to include. If we don't have enough data, they get put to the coming attractions, right? So by definition as of an existing solution, they're already here. Humanity knows what to do and is doing it. A lot of what we're trying to do with Drawdown is almost uh, take a mirror and reflect back to the world what we're doing because we don't really know what everybody is truly doing. And there are people and organizations and companies around the world that are already actively participating in this, right? And so this is a new reframing of how we think by showing the world, hey, we know it, we know what to do, and we can achieve this, right? And increasingly, uh, more and more organizations that are, you know, focused, had been focusing on, say, just energy or just other pieces of it are coming on board as they see this different framework. We have our 200 companies that want to commit to drawdown as a new form of corporate sustainability, right? These are companies and corporations, global corporations, right? We have hubs forming around the world. The European uh, Drawdown Europe is a, is a collaboration between the German Energy Agency, the European Climate Foundation, and the climate knowledge and innovation communities, right? Because they already know what to do, and it's a reframing. They want to shift the system, right? 
to reflect back to the world what we already know. So uh, that's a, perhaps a little flowery response to that, but I think uh, it's important to remember that you know these aren't anything. There's nothing new here. You know, it is being done. And so in terms of the Colombian context, I want to be fully forthright. I am not an expert on Colombia, right? So I want to, and we can't be, I can't be. But, so I'm not going to prescribe anything, but I certainly think um, there's a lot of capacity for Colombia to, first of all, uh, build on what they have already are doing, tropical forest restoration, silvopasture, regenerative agricultural practices, right? They're already doing this, right? And so we need to focus on enhancing that and accelerating these, uh, these solutions, as well as adopting, again, energy transformation, right? We need to um, have a sustain sustainable energy transformation in, uh, in Colombia, uh, throughout Latin America, and so on. And it's challenging to build that infrastructure, but it is a, an essential component for us to achieve drawdown, uh, which is what we need as a, as a society, global society. Thank you, Chad. We'll take a last question over there. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Diana. Uh, thank you, Chad, for your presentation. Uh, I don't know if my question is kind of similar, but uh, uh, Colombia is going to have a new president soon. Um, so if you have to advise the new president or the new government in the environmental plan for Colombia, what, what you, do you think Colombia ha have to promote to have the global challenge solutions, specifically from our country or from South America? Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, for that question. Um, what I would, uh, I would not advise, I would invite. Um, I would invite the president to uh, join the Drawdown Coalition that's forming. Drawdown Colombia is a first step, a commitment to reversing global warming commitment to shared knowledge, shared learning, and a feedback of information that allows us to learn from each other. But to democratize that and to set up a regional hub in Colombia and other parts, where, as I said, we, we were already in the formation of many uh, co uh, hubs at the, at the uh, regional scale, country scale, and municipal scale. Drawdown Toronto has already been launched in Canada, right? We're talking with folks to have Drawdown Mexico, Folks in Drawdown Australia, Drawdown uh, uh, New Zealand, Drawdown Chicago, right? There are municipal scales, country scales, regional scales that are committing to reversing global warming as a new goal for humanity that goes beyond 1.5 or 2 degree targets, right? It's not about the targets. It's about a future that we want. And I think as a first step for uh, the, the new uh, Colombian president, I would uh, have an invitation. Come to this new way of reframing of, and thinking of global warming. And we can do this as a part of a global society and network um, uh, to reverse global warming, to be a solution to the problem statement and to, at the same time, shift. Again, that's really key. Shift a system from one that is exploitative to one that is inherently regenerative in nature. And that invitation I extend. Uh, and to, to every country, to be honest. All right, Chad, thank you so much. Thank you.